Hi, hello everybody. Uh, I'm David Thomason. Uh, I'm the Worldwide Director for Solution Architects for No Name Security. And uh, this presentation is titled, Why Shift Left uh, Isn't Enough. Uh, before I get into the presentation though, I'd like to introduce myself just a little bit. I am not an API developer. Uh, I wrote code back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, however, uh, and my degree is in computer science, so I, I do have a background in, in a number of different uh, programming languages and architectures and things like that. But since 1986, uh, I have been working in the cybersecurity industry. Uh, my first job was with uh, Air Force Intelligence, where I was a C programmer uh, writing code that would help uh, Air Force systems to be C2 compliant, uh, which was our cybersecurity compliance requirements uh, way back then. So I've been doing this a long time. Uh, I've had uh, experience working with companies like Internet Security Systems. Uh, I helped build the uh, uh, Security Operations Center for the Department of Veteran Affairs back in the early 2000s, uh, and then uh, was at uh, a company called Sourcefire that was acquired by Cisco. I was one of the early adopters of, of the Sourcefire platform, ran my company for a while, and then became a part of uh, NSS Labs. And NSS Labs is, uh, I was running their research department for about the last year that they were uh, in operation, and during that time, uh, we did a lot of work on uh, on testing uh, security platforms. Didn't matter what it was, uh, web application firewalls, next generation firewalls, SD-WAN, cloud security products, uh, you name it, we, we tested it. Uh, and so a lot of my background and, and some of the broad, breadth of my experience has to do with the fact that I had a lot of exposure to a lot of technologies uh, while I was at NSS Labs. Uh, but for for the last uh, nine months, 10 months, I've been working with uh, No Name Security. Uh, really happy to be here. This is a, an, an amazing company. Uh, and I uh, want to tell you just a little bit about us. In fact, um, a, lot of, a lot of people always ask, hey, uh, where did you get the name No Name? Well, why, why did that stick around? It sounds like you're still in stealth mode. Uh, and the truth is that early on, before even the first line of code, uh, was written, uh, our founders went to a meeting with uh, about 50 CISOs in the room. And the whole discussion was about uh, security and what their challenges were. And one of the first questions, well, there was a form that they had to fill out to, to, to get into the meeting. And uh, one of the first questions was, what's your company name? Well, they hadn't even created a company yet. They didn't have a legal entity. They hadn't decided on a name yet. So they just wrote no name on the uh, on the form and went in and did their presentation. And uh, one of the CISOs said, I really love your name. I can't believe you guys actually named yourself No Name. And they explained that, no, that really wasn't their name, that they didn't have a name. And almost unanimously, the CISOs in the room said, no, we really like it. That's kind of cool. And so that's how we came up with the name No Name. Uh, that's that's the history behind it. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the other side to that is, is that we have been uh, kind of light on the marketing side, if you will, uh, for a while. And I always like to throw my new VP of marketing under the bus. Uh, and so we, uh, we do things uh, kind of on a, on, a, on a lower scale, I guess, in, in some ways. But I think we have uh, shown ourselves in the industry. And in fact, uh, yesterday, if you weren't on one of my other presentations, you might have heard, if you were there, you would have heard. Uh, but yesterday, we announced that we uh, $60 million round, a B round of venture capital. Uh, so we're now uh, in seven months, we've closed $85 million in venture capital. Uh, and that makes us the youngest uh, and biggest, fastest growing uh, pure play API security uh, company uh, in the world. So pretty excited about being that and being in that position. Uh, young, but big and fast and growing and moving and uh, really, really exciting. Uh, here at No Name Security. So again, let's talk about why uh, no why uh, shift left isn't enough. Let's see. There we go. So for the purposes of this presentation, uh, shift left is the process of designing security uh, into any development project. And I've I've read a bunch of articles. And and again, I, I'm not an API developer. And there's varying uh, uh, definitions of this. Some of a, for some, it's just doing a lot of testing before uh, before putting a, a an API into production. 
Uh, I'm most concerned about the APIs, but in this case, it's really it's it's all of the the application development process um, that we're looking at here. So let me give you, you know, designing test cases uh, along with the use cases early on. Just you know, making sure that you're your testing is going to match up with how the platform or the product is going to be used, the application uh, is going to be used. Identifying those edge cases early on so that we know where to set boundaries and those kinds of things for limiting uh, the data that's going to be transmitted or, or communicated with whatever the application is. Creating test scenarios, test scenarios for each and every minimal viable product. Uh, a lot of organizations, uh, uh, won't necessarily do this on every single one. They'll only do it for uh, specific uh, test scenarios, but that, this is all left. And, and from what I've seen, organizations that have strong and mature uh, uh, testing and shift left uh, type of uh, capabilities, they're doing all of these things. They're using API gateways to simplify authentication and load balancing. So, the question is, why now? And uh, I've asked this question in, in each of my uh, presentations. And the reason why I think that API security has come to the forefront in the way that it has, uh, and why it's so important now is, well, first of all, a lot of it is being made public. But, but secondly, with the push to the cloud, and, and I'm not a big fan of buzzwords, but some of my customers are using words like digital transformation. They know that in order to sell this to the board, they've got to use these words. And so they're going through a digital transformation. They're moving from a data center to a cloud uh, environment and being able to get the data into the cloud and then out to the customers uh, or wherever it needs to be. APIs are absolutely mission critical to getting that done. And we see statistic after statistic that says more and more APIs are being created, more and more are being used. Uh, and that creates a conflict between the security team and the development team or the business unit. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this uh, conflict here in just a little bit. But when we talk to CISOs, and, and I apologize up front if, if I offend anybody that's a, a developer in the room, but when we talk to CISOs, what we find is that uh, most of them will say we have little or no uh, understanding of what's going on in the business unit when it comes to APIs. They're writing these APIs, they're being able to transmit this, this data, they're telling us they're doing it securely, they're saying that they registered it with the, uh, with the API gateway and that they're using good authentication, but it's it's just words and it's the the security guy has little or no visibility into any of this activity uh i have asked dozens and dozens and dozens maybe over a hundred CISOs at this point how many apis do you have in your environment nobody has ever answered that with an accurate uh number i have had a couple that guessed and were radically wrong i've had a few that that uh, gave some sort of an estimate that was a very broad, you know, somewhere between a hundred and a thousand. Now, how, how useful is that? And then the, you know, the third category was I typically would get the shrug. No idea how many APIs we have. Well, if you don't know how many APIs you have, the next question you should be asking yourself is what's being transmitted through those APIs? What, what, what sensitive data from my organization is being carried by those APIs being processed? Uh, if you don't know that information, and obviously you don't because you don't even know how many you have, you've got a much bigger problem. And, and by the way, let me stop. Say, please, hey, everybody, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. I want this to be interactive. I'd love to stop and, and my, my uh, presentation uh, multiple times, as many times as necessary to, to answer as many of your questions as possible. Um, and then the other thing that is happening right now that I think is creating this atmosphere where APIs are a target rich environment is obviously the move to the cloud. And all of the different hybrid environments, whether it's you know, web services, Amazon, uh, Azure, uh, and whether you're using Kong, MuleSoft, Apigee, Tyke, WSO2, uh, any of those guys, uh, there's such a diverse environment 
that it has absolutely made the APIs uh, a, a target-rich environment. Uh, it, it, I won't say it's easy because I don't think a lot of the attacks that we've seen could be classified as easy, while some of them can be. Some of them, those APIs were directly accessible to the internet. They were used in a and all a user had to do was basically uh, utilize a burp suite or a postman or, uh, uh, or even a Python script uh, to basically trigger you know, anomalous behavior with that API or misuse that API. So APIs are definitely under attack. And I have spent a lot of time talking with uh, analyst organizations like, uh, like Gartner, Forrester, uh, 451 Group, all those guys. And you know, all of them will tell you that APIs are, are a big topic right now, big concern. Uh, you know, Gartner said, I think it was in 2019, that by 2022, API abuses will become the most frequent attack vector. Talking with, uh, I think it was Jeremy DeHoyne at Gartner uh, a little while back, and one of the things that he told me is he said, we blew it. And I said, what do you mean? And I thought, uh-oh, uh, you know, what do you mean we blew it? You, you, we're talking about this prediction. And he said, yeah, he said, it, it, it's not going to happen in 2022. It's already happened. 2021 has already is, is the year where APIs are the most frequent uh, attack vector. So we're seeing this over and over again. We've seen it in Experian and Peloton. You probably remember those. They're very recent. But uh, the most recent one, the biggest one that just happened uh, was LinkedIn. 700 million uh, user records uh, were compromised uh, through an, a vulnerable API in LinkedIn. So the, obviously the concerns uh, over API security are now front and center uh, for so many organizations. And you have to believe, and, 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 and you know, in some of these, I, I've got to believe that in in LinkedIn and in Experian and some of these more sophisticated organizations that they have very good uh, shift left practices, that they are doing all kinds of things to build security into the design of their platforms. And, and well, I'll talk about this more in, in just a minute, but uh, we see over and over and over again that even organizations that have very mature uh, around the development of applications miss the mark oftentimes when it comes to uh, the little details when it comes to securing APIs. So <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, I want to hit this first. Is no name was really uh, built upon this particular uh, capability or, or uh, around this API security strategy. And the idea is to be able to discover, analyze, remediate, and test uh, all of your APIs. And that means all of your APIs, 100% of them. Well, in order to do that, you have to be able to know where all of your APIs are. And again, this is a huge blind spot for the security teams. I don't mean to be throwing the security anybody else under the bus, but for whatever reason, the way that this entire uh, industry matured and came to fruition, it really left the security guy out there. And as a security guy, they're responsible for the security of the data of the organization. And yet the business unit typically has the final say on whether an API, an application gets deployed and how it gets deployed and whether or not those findings when you were testing uh, in the latter stages of that sprint to determine whether or not something can go live or not, whether or not there has to be a sacrifice made, whether there's a compromise made, and they go ahead and go forward with an API, even knowing that there might be a vulnerability associated with it. That happens all the time. Uh, and, and again, there's a whole bunch of other reasons why vulnerabilities uh, get left in the environment, um, whether it's APIs that preexisted the API gateways, or whether it's just the expansion of a cloud environment where people are adding you know, public IP addresses and EC2 instances and virtual machines and load balance. And in all of this growth and expansion of the cloud, routes get missed and are now an API that used to be only on a uh, private internal IP address host is now exposed via a public IP that's on the same uh, virtual machine. Now you've got a challenge because it's exposed and it's not even going through the API gateway. It's not being authenticated in any way. 
we see this over and over and over and over with, with organizations. So DART, the, the API security strategy is something that we developed based on these four pillars, being able to discover all of your APIs, then analyzing not only all of the APIs, but also analyzing all of the devices that manage those APIs. So you wanna take a look at your web application firewalls, your API gateways, obviously, uh, your load balancers, even your devices, your hosts, your, your Linux hosts and your virtual machines and your EC2 instances and all those kinds of things. You wanna look at all of those devices as well to be able to analyze them and determine if there are vulnerabilities associated with those APIs. And then you want your platform enough to remediate in just about any way that you need it, whether that has to be a manual remediation because you don't have integration uh, with your firewalls or those kinds of things, uh, your web application firewalls, or whether it's a semi-automatic uh, remediation where a user has to push a button, but once they push that button, the action is taken within the environment, or whether it's done completely automatically. I see this type of an event, so I take this kind of action, or I take this series of actions to make it happen. And there's security tools, for those of you that are, are not on the security side of the house, there are security tools that walk you through that. Um, one of my favorite, uh, the, well, the whole category is called SOAR, my favorite category, Security Orchestration on Response. And what I like about SOAR platforms, totally unrelated to API security, could be any, any platform, <clears throat> is that SOAR gives you the ability to create playbooks. And you can orchestrate those playbooks such that you can manage test each step of the playbook all the way along until you're so satisfied and comfortable that that playbook works the way that it should that you now turn it on to where it's automatic. So it can be, it goes from completely manual to a press a button for each step of the way. And then when you see a mistake, you don't take that step and you say, wait, I can't take that step here. And then you modify the step so that you can have confidence that it'll work. You make the exclusion or whatever needs to have happen there. Uh, and then over a period of time, you learn that that is working extremely well, and so you automate it, and now that series of actions automatically takes place when there's an issue uh, that needs to be resolved. Those, SOAR is one of my favorite technologies, security orchestration, automation, and response. If you haven't looked into them, highly recommend you check out some of those, uh, those platforms. So remediating, uh, you know, Discovering and analyzing is great, but if you don't have the, the ability to take action, if you can't do anything about it once, it's, once you've discovered and analyzed it, you haven't accomplished anything. So you have to have the uh, actionable data, but then you have to be able to, you have to do something with it. So having a, a platform that gives you the opportunity to go from all the way from manual to fully automated responses is very, very important. And then finally, uh, and, and surely not, uh, least uh, of importance is testing. And the reason I have these separated in pillars is because testing can happen at so many different points in the timeline. Testing can start all the way back in the design phase and can go all the way through all of the different uh, 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 agile processes that you've got going on uh, in your environment during the development, in the pre-production you know, uh, stage. All of those, in, in every single phase of the production or of the development phase, we can be doing testing to determine whether or not a, uh, and it's not just feature testing, load testing, performance testing, but also security testing. And that requires the help of really security savvy folks. And sometimes that's where the challenge too, it too comes because the security team is overloaded. They always are, they are they're undermanned and they don't have the personnel to hand over to the development team to say, how do we fully test the security of all these? Hopefully your organization isn't in that kind of position and you've got plenty of security experts to do that. But at the end of the day, you can have a completely good agile experience uh, and still be challenged with how you're going to do, uh, uh, how you're going to do the, um, uh, the DART, or, or how you're going to um, deploy uh, security and, and after you've done all of the, uh, the shift left. So let's just talk about this. Again, the big problem, the speed, the business has to deploy quickly. It's very, very important for the business to get 
uh, to get these applications out the door. It's why we've developed agile processes. It's why we move so fast with two week sprints in a lot of organizations. Uh, and so what happens is at the end of the day, when it's to determine whether or not that application gets deployed or not, the business unit and the, and the security guy butt heads and guess who wins? Well, having been on the security teams for a very long time, it's not very often that the security guy wins. I'll just put it that way. It's very seldom that they win. Uh, there's always, <laughs> I always use the, uh, uh, the analogy of it's three days before Black Friday. Yeah, it, there's no way the security guy is gonna win this. That application has to be out there. That API has to be available. We have to get this information in front of customers right now, or we're gonna lose our opportunity and the biggest opportunity of the year. And guess what? My opinion is security shouldn't win. It's not about security, it's about business. It's about getting the job done. It's about selling things. And even, I'm, even though I'm a security guy, I don't want to handcuff a development team and say, you have to have everything perfect or you have to meet some arbitrary guideline or some arbitrary uh, measurement before we can go forward with this because there's going to be mistakes. There's going to have to be compromises and it shouldn't be a win-lose situation. It should be a win-win for everybody. And that is really our position from a no-name security perspective is we don't wanna slow down the development team. We don't wanna slow down your processes of getting applications out the door. Uh, we wanna see you get these out there very, very, very quickly and then be able to do whatever is necessary to make sure that they are, if there, is, if there are vulnerabilities, if there are issues, that one, they're monitored very closely. And secondly, that we identify them in the production environment or in the pre-production environment, and then get the appropriate trouble tickets back into the system, get the appropriate automation back into the system so that we can protect those APIs, even if they get deployed in a vulnerable state. So let's talk about what that means. So even though security shouldn't win, they shouldn't be blindsided either, right? And that's really where no-name security comes in. And that's why we can support the rapid deployment of APIs without having to set some sort of uh, arbitrary measurement of success or failure on the part of the development team. And then how do we protect the data and maintain the, that's the question at the end of the day, right? How do we protect the data and maintain uh, velocity? We need to keep it going. We don't want to slow it down. We want to see all of this stuff happen. Uh, and uh, let me check the chat here real quick. Anybody have any questions? I want to stop, give everybody a chance. I don't see any questions. Is the chat working? Let me, uh, let me throw something in here. Um, if you want to get in hold, a hold of me, I'm David T at nonamesecurity.com. Well, it looks like the chat is working. Great. So um, if you have any questions, please, let's, let's make this a little bit interactive. Um, I would love to hear from you uh, as we move forward in this uh, presentation. So let's see, get back on the right screen here. So what does that mean? It means that you can have your cake and your API security and eat it too or speed and security without compromise. It means that you continue to use the agile model. You continue to develop and to produce MVPs and deploy those MVPs. And we'll be right there to watch over everything that happens uh, in that deployment process. We'll be there to see what's going on in your environment. We'll if, if that API gets discovered or gets deployed and we've never seen it before, we'll discover it on the first call. Uh, on the first request to that particular API. We'll then pull the different components of that API, the headers, the bodies of both the requests and the responses. We'll tell you what kind of information is being stored in it, what the schema of that API is, not in the way it was documented, not in the way it was designed, not even in the way uh, that it is uh, developed, but by the way that it is transmitted on the wire. One of the beautiful things about the way that we do things is that we actually re reconstitute the schema of every single API based on the traffic that we see uh, that that API produces. And based on that traffic, we can see the components of that API, and then we can give you back a, uh, a working schema, a documented swagger, if you will, 
uh, of that particular API in the way that it's being seen uh, on the wire. And, and that is a beautiful thing. Um, let me give you a, a few of examples. Um, in, uh, in a recent POC, uh, we discovered that a customer uh, utilize, utilizes gift cards. Uh, and in the utilization of those gift cards, uh, they had a, uh, an authorization, or, yeah, uh, authentication token. And so the, uh, the, the authentication token was using uh, JWT and HS256 for encryption. Everything looked to be really good on it. Uh, however, in the way that it got deployed, uh, there was a lack of validation of the different data types within that gift card. And so somebody who was using something like, uh, well, we were, you could use Python scripts and that's how we demonstrated it back to the customer. But we were able to show them that because of a lack of validation of data in that particular uh, API, somebody could buy a gift card, uh, let's say, and, and have that gift card loaded with you know, $300 and pay $3 for the gift card. And, and it, there was just a, a, a misstep in the validation of the data in that environment. And we could identify that and we could identify it very, very quickly. So those are the kinds of things that, because we can see that kind of thing, we can also then trigger the fact that, hey, there's an issue. Did it happen once? Did it happen 500 times? Can we now go do something about it? What about remediating it? We identify it immediately. Now, of course, we want to build a trouble ticket. We'll integrate with your Remedy, your Trello, your ServiceNow, your Jira, whatever uh, uh, trouble ticketing system you have. We'll integrate with that. We'll send you the trouble ticket right away. More importantly, we see that it's happened and oh, and we that security orchestration automation and response capability. Guess what? If that kind of integration is in place, now we can take, a, take advantage of that and say, okay, we saw this happen. Now we need to stop that guy from having access to our platform. So maybe we block the IP address or maybe we uh, revoke their credential. Uh, maybe we take some other kind of action. It all depends on what our playbook says is the responsible way to react to this particular an event. In that particular case, depending on the amount of traffic and the number of people buying uh, gift cards on your platform, it may be that you want to just stop selling gift cards for a little while, block that API until you get that fixed. That would probably be my suggestion. But in that case, there's different ways that you could do that, right? You could integrate with the API gateway that, that's offering up that API. Uh, you could uh, operate with the uh, web application firewall and block the endpoint. There's all kinds of things that you could do to, to keep that from happening some more. But this is the idea. We want our customers to be able to continuously roll out traffic, roll out their APIs, to roll out their applications and not have to spend, uh, we, we want them to spend as much time, and uh, let me be clear. I have never met a developer that wanted to write code that wasn't secure. Everybody wants to write good quality secure code. There's, there's no question about that. So that's not the question. The question is, you know, I've got a deadline. I've got so much that I've got to do. I forgot. I missed that step. And I know it has to be functional. And so I've got to get it done. And there's a step that gets missed in the security uh, checklist on that particular uh, API or in that particular application. And as a result, it gets rolled out without having that done. It's not somebody's to make insecure code. It's the position they're put in. It's the responsibility that they have. It's the, the business units uh, push to go faster and faster and faster. And at the end of the day, we want them to feel secure in the fact that, hey, even though I've got to dump this out here faster than I want to, I've got somebody watching my back. And what this does is that bridges the gap, if you will, between the security team and the DevOps team. Because like I said before, there's, there's this tension, there's this conflict of between the velocity of the business unit and the security team. The security team feels like they're blind and they're having to, that they can't even discover what's out there. The, the business unit on the other hand says, we've got to get this done because we've got to meet our deadlines. We've got to meet these requirements in order to be able to do this business. And as a result, we've got this conflict. With no name in the, in, the, in the position, we can bridge that gap. We can tell you that, hey, you've got issues, 
but hey, here's all of the tickets that need to be taken care of in order to fix these issues associated with the APIs, associated with the way they're developed, associated with the way they're configured in the API gateway, even associated with the way they're deployed on the uh, virtual machine, the container that they're in, if you're using service mesh or something like that. We'll see all of those kinds of issues and then be able to report those back to the development team and to the right development team to get those issues into the hands of the right people so that it can be addressed as soon as possible. You don't even have to skip a, a sprint in order to get uh, the security data that you need uh, once that API has been deployed. Now, I don't see any questions, so I don't know if the chat, if I've got a, uh, a one-way connection on the chat, but I'd, I'd love to answer your question. I see that we've got a few people in the uh, uh, in the room, so if you have any questions, please uh, please give me a a ring here. So again, let's just talk briefly. You know some of the things that we discover. Uh, we've got a few minutes left in in this uh, in this roundtable. I think I've got about 15 minutes left. Let's just talk about some of the things that we discover, right? The no-name platform connects to your cloud, it connects to your data center, and then it looks at the information in that environment and gives you information about all of your APIs. And it doesn't matter whether they are uh, routed between these two virtual machines uh, or whether they're routed between the virtual machine and the API gateway. We're gonna see those APIs wherever they are. Rogue, we, we call them rogue APIs when they are uh, not going through the API gateway and should be. Uh, we call uh, zombie APIs, APIs that should be dead, but for whatever reason have been resurrected. Uh, and then of course, uh, you've got other APIs that uh, that are unauthorized. Well, they're just some place where they shouldn't be altogether. Uh, and let me explain, I, I've talked a little bit about APIs that that uh, get exposed to the internet when they shouldn't be. Uh, let's just say, for example, we have an API that's running through, uh, running between these two uh, virtual machines, right? And because your cloud is expanding, as I was er talking about earlier, people are standing up more clusters, they're standing up more virtual machines, they're standing up more load balancers and so on. And now all of a sudden, you've got a new load balancer that connects to the backside, I call it the backside, but of, of this uh, virtual cluster and provides a public IP address to it. Now that API that was only exposed internally with a private IP address before has visibility out to the internet through this public IP address. Now it may not get discovered right away because most of the calls coming in from web apps and mobile apps and all those kinds of things are gonna be directed to the API gateway. They're gonna go the right direction before they get popped out here. However, somebody who's not, who doesn't care about your API and finds out about that public IP address might be able to find that particular uh, endpoint. And when they do, now they've got access to that particular API without going through the gateway, which means you've lost all of your uh, rate limiting capabilities. You, well, your load balancer might protect that, but you've definitely lost uh, your authentication capabilities on that particular API. Now, whatever data it, it pulls, can be pulled without authentication in many cases. We see this time after time after time after organizations that are moving to the cloud. They're moving there so fast that uh, architecture reviews can't catch every single one of these. And the security team doesn't even know about this API that existed in the first place. So when the security architect looks at the architecture and says, oh yeah, you're standing up another uh, EC2 instance and you're uh, reutilizing or, or utilizing this loud load balancer to provide, you know, oh, that's a really good idea. You know, the, the thought may or may not ever occur that there could be an API, uh, you know, back here on the back end that is uh, associated with these. And so as a result, those kinds of things get missed all the time. Um, what else do we discover? Things like resources. What is the instance ID and the server name uh, of the host for a particular API? Which application or business unit is responsible for that API? We even look into the headers and the data types of particular APIs that will show you who the API owner is. Why is that important? Because at the end of the day, when that security team gets the alert, they don't wanna to have to spend all day figuring out who needs to be responsible for fixing this API. They wanna automatically put it into a team that gets the JIRA 
ticket or the ServiceNow ticket that says, hey, there's an issue associated with this API. We need somebody to go fix it. What else can we do? Data governance. This is a common, common issue with every security, uh, with every CISO out there, with every cyber uh, chief information security officer. This is a huge issue for them. Data governance, PII, PHI, it doesn't, you know, uh, it doesn't matter what the governance is. API data often carries these kinds of sensitive data. And when the CISO is, uh, is blind to it, it's a huge challenge. Now, today, I can tell you that the vast majority of auditors out there have not caught up to API security. They haven't figured out how to audit it. They haven't figured out how to enforce API security other than looking at what the organization is doing from a shift left perspective. So for most of you, you may be in really good shape if you're doing a lot of shift left things. They don't know how to audit the back end. I, I should, but uh, I think auditors are very quickly going to figure out that shift left doesn't mean that you can ignore right. It means that you really have to go looking at the right to make sure that everything that you did in the shift left has been validated and can't be broken because of some uh, user error. Uh, and I'll give you an example of one of those user errors, I think, on the next slide. Yes, uh, misconfigurations. Oftentimes, these misconfigurations are simply missing the checkbox. Uh, we've gone from discover now to analyze. We're analyzing. Uh, API traffic, we're analyzing API behavior, we're analyzing the configuration of API devices, and what do we have? We have APIs that are, again, accidentally open to the internet that don't have a rate limit or without authentication validation. Um, <clears throat> what does that mean? That means you did something and it was probably a user error that created a situation where this API is no longer authenticated. And I, I talked to CISOs Again, they're my primary customer. That's who I go to talk to most often. And one of the things that I find out from them is that the, the hypothetical scenarios that I put in front of them happen all too often. And one of those that I put in front of them all the time is, hey, you've got an application or an API that has an issue and a developer has to uh, debug that issue. And in the process of debugging that issue, they turn off the authentication because they can run a lot more tests much more quickly and it and they fix it they find the issue they resolve the issue and then they forget to turn the authentication back on i'll bet that's never happened to you mr Sizzo. and almost every one of them goes like you know gives me some sort of uh you know you know joke yeah like which week right or <laughs> it, these kinds of mistakes are are going to happen we know they're going to happen uh they happen to the security team they happen to the developers they happen to the marketing team they happen to everybody uh, so we know that most of these issues are often caused by a simple human error. And without the ability to audit and to look at it from, a, from the right side, as opposed to shifting left and looking at it out on, we'll never be able to see. Uh, we, we, we have very, very difficult time figuring out uh, that that has occurred until there's a, a much bigger issue. So I guarantee you over the next year or so, Auditors are going to figure this out. They're going to want to monitor this. There is going to be a big push for the monitoring of API security, whether it's through logs, whether it's through um, you know, real-time traffic analysis, whether it's through uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. All of that you know, is, is up to debate, but there will be governance around uh, the, the uh, monitoring of APIs in the, in the near future. It will become part of their governance requirements. Speaking of anomalies, anomalies for us means the misuse of, a, of an API. When an API gets used, the vast majority of the time, it is used the same way over and over and over again. And I always use, uh, when I'm talking to non-API knowledgeable people, the the example of a mobile app, right? It's just loaded with APIs. You push a button, it triggers an API, goes out, makes a call, the data comes back. Everybody that uses that API uses it the same way. They push the button on their mobile app and time after time after time it comes back. When when somebody does when when somebody pushes that button 
and the information doesn't look right coming back, it's probably because they didn't actually push the button. They probably used Postman or Burp Suite or a Python script to go out and make something happen. Those are the kinds of things that you want to be able to identify. It's those outliers. It's those uh, issues that that are beyond what would be normal in the environment. And uh, so uh, a low false positive rate is critical. We don't want to be called a barking dog. We don't want to uh, we don't want to be known for uh, sounding the alarm when there is no uh, no to do to go after. Uh, but on the other hand, it's very important that you catch uh, all of the issues, uh, as many of the issues as possible and as quickly as possible. I already talked a lot about the remediating. Uh, you can use remediation to integrate. You can use remediation for prevention. Uh, I like to talk about manual, semi-automated, and fully automated remediation utilizing security orchestration, automation, and response. Uh, and then finally, the test. Um, I'm going to wrap up with this with this slide uh, on on why shift left isn't enough. Again, if you have any questions, uh, please drop them in the uh, in the chat. I'd love to love to answer your questions. Um, you know, I know that that most applications, or at least I would like to believe that most applications are deployed uh, are tested before they're deployed. I I honestly believe that most APIs are not. And they may be functionally tested, uh, but from a security perspective, what we see in so many environments based on, the, on, on our customer data, on the proof of concept and the proof of value tests that we have done is that there, while there may be standards that organizations are using for developing and deploying those APIs, there is so much that gets missed that I can't believe that security testing is given serious consideration, even in some of the most mature environments for uh, agile deployment of, of software. Um, you know, it's, it's so important to apply rigorous testing to detect vulnerabilities before they're deployed. And again, you know, I'll jump back to a little bit of a, a pitch here in that the no name platform were, were this month we came out with our active testing module, which allows us to identify new APIs, even in a pre-production environment, and then test those APIs based on what we see. So if they're using JWT uh, for uh, authentication, we'll automatically run a set of JWT vulnerability tests against it. If they are utilizing sensitive data, we'll run some sensitive data tests uh, against that to make sure that those are uh, authorized uh, adequately. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we will uh, do. A, we have quite a number of uh, suites of tests, if you will, that when an API is discovered or when it's in the pre-production environment, you can either automatically or uh, or uh, or manually run those tests against it. It'll integrate with your Jenkins, with your CI/CD pipeline, uh, and so it's very very important uh, that you test those APIs. One of the beautiful parts about our platform as well is that if you want to also deploy in the production environment, you can do so without having to worry about it impacting your production environment. We can test even while in production. It won't uh, disrupt the ability to identify uh, actual attacks versus testing uh, data in the environment. Testing data can be automatically uh, captured uh, and, and routed so that it doesn't uh, impact your operations. There are so many things that we can do and pretty exciting uh, capability that we have. So again, if, if you would like a demo, I'd like to see what we're doing, uh, please contact me after uh, uh, after the presentation. We'd love to set something up with you. My email address is in the chat. It's davidt at nonamesecurity.com or you can just use dt at nonamesecurity.com as well. Uh, so any questions? Uh, really appreciated your time today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope uh, this was informative for you and that you got something of value out of it. And uh, I'll look forward to uh, meeting you again in, in the near future. Any questions?